Good morning. We're glad to have you with us on today. And uh, yes, this is not a background today. Uh, we are in the uh, sanctuary on the second floor. I'll uh, bring our Bible study today. Uh, we're testing and checking some things out. Hope you're able to uh, get this uh, video lesson on today. Uh, we're going to open up with our uh, opening passage of scripture. And then we're going to have our invocation, and then we're going to go right into the lesson. Our passage of scripture, our devotional passage of scripture is coming from one of my favorites, Psalm 51, beginning at verse 1 through 13. In the language of the King James Version, it sounds like this. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judge. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Have thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners will be converted unto thee. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to see another day which we've never seen before. The health and strength you've given us. We ask that you be with us now as we come together to share in this topic, this Bible study, this discussion, this sharing, this learning on today. Be with those who have long been to be with us. Be with those who have come by to share with us. Be with those who have a desire to be with us and cannot. Continue to keep us all it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. All right. We are thankful for the opportunity to be here on today. And as always, I just want to give honor and respect to our Pastor Meredith, Dr. Joseph B. Felker, Jr., and Sister Shirley Felker, as well as all of the deacons and trustees, the officers, the members, and the friends of Mount Carmel uh, that are sharing with us. We thank God for each and every one of you. Now, we're getting ready to start a new study on today. That new study is going to be in the book of Isaiah. Uh, I'm excited about it, looking forward to sharing some great things about it uh, as we share in these studies together. But uh, today what we're going to do is we're really going to frame it up, we're going to craft it for you. Uh, we're going to introduce it uh, as we prepare to uh, go through uh, this particular study. So now as we prepare to do that, it's important for us to understand, brothers and sisters, that Christians in the world today hold the birth, death, Resurrection of Jesus is our only hope of salvation from sin and judgment and for our future hope of eternal life. Now, the prophets of the Old Testament also grounded their hopes for the redemption of Jesus, whom they knew as the promised Messiah. We look toward Jesus in his return coming back to us. The prophets of old looked toward Jesus as the Messiah coming the first time. Now, while believers today look back through faith to the salvation achieved by Christ, Old Testament prophets look forward through faith to the fulfillment of God's promised salvation. Interestingly enough, we look back through faith and we, we, we talk about, you know, were you there when he was crucified on the cross? When you there, were you there? We weren't there, but in faith we believe and we trust in the realities of the fact that Jesus was born, Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose again. But now the prophets, on the other hand, they look forward to the coming of Jesus, being born of a manger, having the government on his shoulders, and all of these things. And so interestingly enough, when we look at all of this, we look at we as Christians looking uh, backwards through our faith to what Jesus accomplished, and the prophets looking forward with their faith, looking toward a coming Messiah to do all the things that he did do for us, even today. Now, perhaps no other prophet looked forward with 
uh, such detail and such beauty uh, as Isaiah. Isaiah uh, is a beautiful descriptive writer as he shares the inspirations that the Holy Spirit gave him as he wrote uh, his book. And we're going to really enjoy sharing that. Now, <clears throat> in our studies, we will explore the book of Isaiah in all its history and its prophecy. And we will focus on the promises that are connected to the Messiah. Together, we will learn about the prophet who spoke with power to both kings and commoners among God's people. As a matter of fact, Isaiah was one of the prophets along with Amos who was one of his contemporaries. But Isaiah was one where the phrase was coined, speaking truth to power. Okay, Isaiah had no problem speaking to kings and he had no problem speaking to his people. Okay, he was able to have the common touch and he was able to touch, uh, speak the language of the royals at the same time. It became important for them to do that. We will hear of God's judgment pronounced both against the nation of Israel and her enemies. We will explore the promise of deliverance for Isaiah's contemporaries. We will examine the wonderful descriptions of God's ultimate deliverance through the life and ministry of his suffering servant, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Now, let's take a look at who the, who the writer of this book is. Let's take a look at Isaiah for a minute. Now, the book Isaiah derives its title from the author, whose name in Hebrew means Yahweh, or the Lord is salvation. Now, in this regard, the name Isaiah is similar to the names Joshua, Elisha, and Jesus, which carry the same meaning. The Lord is salvation. So now you got something for your little trivia discussion when you're at home over the holidays, and you can talk to the young people. You can say, which three names or which four names all mean the same thing? When you talk about Isaiah, Joshua, Elisha, and Jesus, what do those three, what do those four names have in common? They all mean the same. They all mean the Lord is salvation. Amen. Now, the New Testament authors quote passages from Isaiah more than 65 times. And this is a greater number than any other Old Testament prophet. Isaiah is quoted more than any of the other Old Testament prophets. Now, throughout the Bible, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, a number of Old Testament prophets are quoted. And a number of Old Testament passages are quoted. But it is Isaiah that is quoted more throughout the New Testament than any other writer, any other prophet. For instance, Isaiah is mentioned by name more than 20 times in the New Testament. One of those examples is in Romans 9 and 29, when Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words. And just as Isaiah foretold, if the Lord of armies had not left us descendants, we would become like Sodom and would have been like Gomorrah. Okay, so now we see that Paul mentions Isaiah by name in the New Testament. But now, Looking further, in Luke's gospel account, we read that Jesus began his ministry in Nazareth by quoting from the prophet Isaiah. We'll find that in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. Look, I'm going to read it for you. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Verse 17, and the scroll of Isaiah, there he is, the prophet was handed to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, Isaiah, he's the son of Amos. He ministered in and around Jerusalem as a prophet to Judah during the reign of four kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. Those four kings were Uzziah, or Uzziah as some people call him. Uh, also, he's also referred to as uh, Azariah in the second kings. But also Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Isaiah was a ministry, his ministry as a prophet 
was during the reign of these kings. Now, Isaiah was a contemporary of the prophets Hosea and Michael, Micah rather, and evidently came from a family of some rank because he had easy access to the king. Now, mind you, every prophet did not have the ability uh, or even the affordability to just go to the king and speak to the king. Okay, but Isaiah did, which gives us the impression that he had to have some kind of, he had to have some real family rank in his life to where he had the respectability of having no problems going before the kings and the kings receiving him, whether they liked his message or not. Now, Isaiah was married and he had two sons. One of his sons' names is Shajazhub, Shajazhub. Sheer jazz up. Okay? And that means a remnant shall return. And his other son was named Maher Shalah Hashbaz. Okay? Maher Shalah Hashbaz. Maher Shalah Hashbaz. And it means hastening to the spoil or hurrying to the prey. Okay? Now, when God called Isaiah to prophesy, in the year of King Uzziah's death, he responded with a cheerful readiness, okay? Uh, he was really excited and ready to go uh, uh, when he saw the Lord. As a matter of fact, the passage that we will get to uh, when we get into our next session, uh, passage opens with, in the, the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord, okay? Now, unfortunately, tradition states that he met his death uh, under the rule of King Manasseh by being cut in two with a wooden saw. That was a pretty horrible way uh, to be martyred. But yet and still, uh, there it was. And, and it goes to show you, unfortunately, how the hatred of the prophet of God, when the prophet of God is telling you the truth of God and you don't want to hear it. Amen. Okay? Now, uh, Isaiah prophesied during the period of the divided kingdom. His prophecies were directed to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, he condemned the empty ritualism of his day and the idolatry that the people had fallen into. I mean, some of the people were going through the motions of worship. I mean, it sounds like the 21st century in some cases, okay? Okay, their, their rituals... Uh, they were doing their rituals, but they were empty rituals. They didn't mean it. They just did it because they were doing it or because they were supposed to do it, not because they wanted to have any relationship with God or because they were responding to any act of God or, or any action of God. But it was just, well, we're supposed to do this, so let's just do this and let's just get it over with so we can move on with our lives. It was empty ritualism. And, of course, there was idolatry as well. Now, Isaiah, he foresaw the coming of Babylonian captivity because of Judah's departure from the Lord. And he talked about this years before it would even happen. And that's one of the interesting things we're going to find out about Isaiah. And that Isaiah talks about stuff that's going to happen in a few days. But he also talks about stuff that's going to happen not even in the lifetime of himself or others. But he talks about them both at the same time. And so it becomes very, very important that we take a careful look at his prophecies because stuff that he's talking about is not just what I call when I'm dealing with prophecies, foretelling or what God says, but it's also foretelling about what's going to happen later, okay? So now, some of the prophecies uh, that Isaiah gave were fulfilled during his lifetime. And like I just said a few minutes ago, some of, a lot of them were not, okay? But some of them were. For instance, King Sennacherib, King Sennacherib, that's Sennacherib, okay? Uh, King Sennacherib's efforts to take Jerusalem failed, just as Isaiah said it would. Okay? God healed Hezekiah's critical illness, just as Isaiah had predicted. You all may be familiar with Hezekiah when he was sick and he was going to die. And, and the Bible says he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto God. And God told Isaiah, go tell Hezekiah he got 15 more years to live. Okay? Oh, and, and he lived 15 more years, just, just as Isaiah had predicted. Another prophecy was long before Cyrus, king of Persia, appeared on the scene. Isaiah named him as Judah's deliverer from the Babylonian captivity. And that's one of the most interesting things about 
uh, Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah could not only prophesy about the children of Israel being taken into captivity by the Babylonians, which hadn't happened yet, but then also could tell them when they would be delivered from captivity, which definitely hadn't happened yet. And not only that, who would do it? Now that goes to show you how powerful God is. Well, God can tell you what's going to happen to you, how you're going to come out of it, and who's going to bring you out of it. And he tells you that all at the same time. You know, that's truly amazing. Okay? And it's one of the, one of the great things about this particular book. And people, uh, and Isaiah, what he does. Now, Isaiah is also known uh, as the uh, evangelical prophet. And I know that in these days and times, <clears throat> it becomes almost difficult to be politically correct uh, to say evangelical with any positivity, especially with the climate that we have had, this political climate that we have had. But I'm here to tell you that uh, Isaiah was an evangelical prophet that not only knew how to reach, but he also knew how to make absolutely sure that he told the truth about and to those that were in power, regardless of what the potential was for him. He did not uh, uh, support people just because of his personal views. Okay, if he felt, if God showed him that they were wrong, uh, he told them that they were wrong. And that becomes important because so many times we live in a day and a time when there are so-called uh, evangelicals that are supporting wrong things and yet and still saying that uh, they're on the Lord's side. Well, I'm here to tell you that uh, there's really something to think about. Okay? Now... One of the things that he did was he spoke much, Isaiah spoke much about the grace of God toward Israel, especially in the last 27 chapters of the book. He talks about what grace God is going to give them. And what is grace? Undeserved love, right? And so, you know, and it lets us know that even through the wrongs and the and they missteps, that God still has a love for them. No matter time and time again, they would turn to God and say, oh, Lord, we'll serve you. You're our God. We're your people. And then they'll turn around and do evil in the sight of the Lord. But yet and still, God had grace for them. And that's a message for us. Because I know, well, maybe you don't, but there are people in this life that don't get it right every day, that mess up sometimes, that don't do the things that they should do time and time and time again, who have a desire to do good, and just like Paul says, but then evil is always present to cause us to go to the right or to the left or to go in reverse, or whatever the case may be. But when we come to ourselves, thanks be unto God, we go to God, and God will forgive us. He will restore us, and that's grace. And I'm telling you, because sometimes we may not even deserve being forgiven because of the magnitude or because of what we did or what we said. Okay, so it becomes important for us to understand that. Now, the centerpiece uh, of this book is found in Isaiah 53, in, in which... He portrays Christ as the slain lamb of God. There's a familiar passage, and I got it, I have it for you today in, in the King James Version. And you, know, you know, I like, when we're studying, I like using the New American Standard Bible. But I think everyone knows this one in the King James. So I wanted to leave that in there so that everybody could get that feel. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. See, I knew you knew it. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Amen. Amen. You know, that just wouldn't have had the same ring if I'd have rang that out to you in the NIV. No. If I'd have gave it to you in the New American Standard Bible. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so now, having said all of those things today, hopefully this gives us a framework from which we will begin our studies into the book of Isaiah. Now, we'll begin next week, if it's the Lord's will. And the topic will be Judah's social sins. Judah's social sins. Now, Isaiah is a large book. And so it's important for us to understand that as we prepare to study, we're going to be dealing with a number of chapters in each session. And so it becomes important for us to understand that we're not going to do this like a chapter at a time or stuff like that. We're going to take them in groupings. And the grouping for next week will be Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 22. And then we're going to use chapter 5, verse 1, through chapter 6, verse 13. And so, Lord willing, we have opportunity to do that. Okay? Again, that'll be Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. And that's going to go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22. And then we're going to jump to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. And we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 6, 
verse 13. Again, 1-1 one, one to 2-22. And then we're going to go 5-1 to 6-13. Okay? So that's going to be our study for today. We're hoping and praying that God has blessed you. We hope we've been able to help to you today. I'm excited about this study of Isaiah. I'm also excited about today being day one of our 40 days of restoration. And I'm hoping and praying uh, that you have uh, your scripture information and you're prepared uh, to start your time of day one's passage as well as uh, your prayer and your time of fasting during those two-hour periods, whatever two-hour period you can find. And then make sure that you pray at least three times during that two-hour period. Open up with a prayer. Then about middle ways, just take a moment and pray. And then as you close your two-hour period, make sure that you pray again. And so uh, until we see you on this coming Saturday, if the Lord says the same, uh, we'll be sharing with you again. And until then, take care. God bless. I want to thank Sister Jones, our camera person, for being with us. Say hello, Sister Jones. Hello, everybody. And so you all take care, and until next time.